we know they were here in pretty big number because they left a specific type of pottery that's got little checks on it, like a checkerboard. That was their trademark, that was their style. And that represents their culture, and that's really all we have to go by as to their lifestyle, is the things that they made and used and left. Now, over time, a group of Native Americans came up from Florida, 1500s, and these were the Tamuqua. And they stayed here because the Spanish were really horrible to them. They enslaved them, used them as workers, and the Tamuqua decided they just wanted to get on away from the Spanish, and they came and settled here in the Okefenokee. Now, the Spanish were here for a while, too, and there's evidence to support that because on two of our islands, there were Catholic missions where the Spaniards tried to convert the Tamuqua who were here to Christianity. Do you know which islands it was? Yes. There was one over on Floyd's Island, and there was another one near the Kingfisher Landing. Now at that time, the Creek Indians lived around the Okefenokee, and you could consider the Tamuqua to be Creek, but the Creek didn't come in here in big numbers. They just pretty much settled around the perimeter, but it was the Tamuqua that lived here um, and made it their home to get away from the, the Spaniards in Florida. Now over time, there weren't many Tamuqua left. They got diseases from the Spanish, as did other Creek tribes, the Hitchiti, the Yamasee, and the Miccosukee. And they eventually banded together with the Tamuqua and became known as the Seminoles. Now that's a Creek word that means rebel or renegade or runaway, okay? Seminoles, Hitchiti, Yamasee, Miccosukee, and Tamuqua, all of them did not want to comply with the wishes of the federal government, and that was for them to go west, to leave Georgia, to leave Florida. Now, does anyone know what we call the government's movement of the Native Americans out to Oklahoma? On the trail of tears. tears. Very good. Now, there were three Seminole Wars fought. The first one and the third one did not involve the Okefenokee, but the second one did. In particular, there was about 150 Seminoles that made camp over on Billy's Island. And they would leave from time to time and go out looking for food and sometimes would run into problems with the white settlers, the cracker settlers. And one of those families that really, really <laughs> suffered from the Seminoles was the Wilds family. Now when you came into the um, island this morning, across the bridge, over to the right, that's the Wilds cabin. And it's a replica that was put here by the Wilds family to commemorate the role that their family had in Okefenokee history. And one morning, these Seminoles attacked that family. Eight of the family members did not survive, both parents and six children. But four of the brothers and a cousin did escape. And as quickly as they could, they went to the nearby soldiers that had been recently stationed in this area to tell them what had happened. Now, the Wilds Massacre was the last Indian massacre in the state of Georgia. There had been others in this area before, but this would be the last one. Now, because of the trouble that the Wilds family had, the state of Georgia and the federal government realized the seriousness of the threat that the Seminoles posed to the people here. And they sent in reinforcements, both federal and more state soldiers, combined with local volunteers, the militia, and they spent months and months, late 1838, early 1839, searching this swamp back and forth, east and west, north and south, 
trying to find those fellows responsible for the Wilds family's killing. And the leader of that intensive uh, investigation was a man named General Charles Floyd. Now, while he and other military people were here, they not only were looking for the Native Americans responsible for that tragedy, they were making maps of the area. And that's some of the first map making that ever went on here in the state of Georgia, in the swamp in particular. And they made records of the animals and the plants and even how the people lived here and around the swamp and they would write reports back to the governor and tell him what was going on and those reports were published in newspapers and so that's how the people became aware of the Okefenokee Swamp was that second Seminole War. Well long story short General Charles Floyd and his men never were able to track down the men responsible for the Wilds Massacre. Now they did find an encampment over on Billy's Island where they believed about 150 uh, warriors had been, but it had been cleared out for a couple of months. So these guys, uh, the Seminoles, pretty much made their attack and once the heat got too hot with the, the uh, increased number of soldiers, they left and went to who knows where, but probably back, back to the Everglades. Now. Once the Third Seminole War was over in the 1850s, people like you and I felt like it was safe for them to bring their families into the swamp and make it their home, and they did. Now, a lot of these early pioneers were of Scotch-Irish descent, Scotland-Ireland, they were of European descent. And they were known as crackers back home in England the English called them crackers because the word crack is to joke, to boast, to talk big, to tell it. And so that mm, stereotype from England and their vision of the Scottish Irish kind of came on down with that people into the Okefenokee. Now these crackers were cowboys. They spent much of their time minding cattle, especially here on the Cowhouse Island and throughout South Georgia. And these crackers, these cowboys, would spend other parts of their time hunting because furs were a source of income. They might not get money for them, but they could take them to Trader's Hill over at the St. Mary's uh, River uh, near Folkestone and they could trade their furs for coffee, salt, gunpowder, lead, and flour so they could bake bread or biscuits. See we had plenty of corn for cornmeal and cornbread but no flour. Now these crackers loved their dogs. Their hunting dogs were like members of the family. An experienced hunting dog was worth his weight in gold. Now, there was one fella that had a dog that was so trained and experienced that he didn't even have to put out traps to catch his animals. Let me tell you how he did it. Off trappers, once they got hides off of various animals, would stretch them, okay? and make them as big and flat and, and soft and pretty as they could because they would bring more money when they sold them to the furriers. And in stretching these hides, sometimes the board, it looked kind of like a skateboard, but it was flat and no wheels. Well, the kind of animal that you wanted to stretch the hide for depended a lot on, well, what kind of board you were gonna need. So, if it was an otter, you might have a long, skinny board, like a skateboard. If it was a raccoon, something that was, you know, shorter and more round, you might have a rounded stretching board. Okay, so different boards, different sizes, were used with different 
different animals. Now, one fella walked out on his back porch one day and he was carrying one of his stretching boards. Well, his dog looked up, took off into the swamp, and he came back with a beautiful mink. That's an animal. Well, that was a mink stretching board. So it wasn't long after that, and this fellow was out in his yard, and he happened to be carrying an otter stretching board. Well, the dog looked up, and he saw that otter board, and he took off into the swamp, and he came back with a nice, sleek otter. That man kind of caught on. Oh, okay, this is how it is. So, he showed his dog a fox stretching board. Sure enough, it wasn't long, off that dog went and came back with a pretty red fox with a white tip on his tail. It's a nice, nice fox. Well, that went on for a while, and his wife happened to be crossing the yard one day. She was carrying her ironing board. And the dog saw the ironing board and took off into the swamp, and he never came back. <laughs> <laughs> that was a story that used to, uh, used to be told by Lim Griffiths. Lim Griffiths had a fish camp over near the Billy's Island, Jones Island pocket entrance, the Stephen Foster entrance. Lim Griffiths was quite a fella, a lot of stories. He said if everybody that told a story on the swamp went to hell, that hell was probably already full. <laughs> Now we know a lot about the people of the Okefenokee because folks, like the military, came in to survey it, to make maps of it, to, to decide, well, you know, where's the good land, where's the not so acceptable land, what can we farm, what is uh, good enough that the government could sell it and make some money off of it. And these surveyors took notes on not just the dimensions of various features of the swamp, but they took notes on the people that they encountered. And they put their information in reports, just like the military would send them to the governor, well these surveyors would send those reports to the governor, or straight to newspapers. And people all over the state, really all over the country, could read these sources and learn about the pioneers <coughs> in the Okefenokee. Now another fella that taught us much about pioneers here was Mr. Francis Harper. Francis Harper came here with a group of scientists from Cornell University, first time in 1912, and he fell in love with the place. And he kept coming back many times between then and the 1950s. And Francis Harper made 38 notebooks with information on the people that he was with. The Chessers, um, the Roddenberries, the Mazelles, the Cruises, Thrifts, Tatums, Coxes, Barbers, and that's how we have information uh, from Francis Harper on how these other pioneers lived. Now, pioneers were very isolated here in the middle of nowhere. And they had to do their own doctrine, their own medicine. And apparently they had a problem with warts. Does anybody have a wart you'd like to get rid of? You got a wart? Okay, if you had a wart, thanks for watching that gator back there. If it's closer, I need to know. If you had a wart, they'd give you one of these. Inside it is a kernel of corn, and for every wart that you had, they would put additional kernels inside. Now your instructions would be to at some point drop it behind you where somebody else would pick it up. Don't look back to see where it landed, that's the hard part, and say, go away wart. And they believe that would take care of it. Now, if you had a case of the bad nerves and you weren't inclined to take a touch of moonshine for it, they'd go find one of these sweet gum trees and they'd get the leaves 
and they'd steep that into a tea and drink it, and they believed that would calm their nerves. Hmm. If you ever got the measles, they would go out into the swamp and gather up a batch of these uh, golden trumpet plants. They're carnivorous, okay? Just like the uh, hooded pitcher plant, these golden trumpet plants are both carnivorous. They eat insects, they eat meat. Anyway, for the measles, they would steep uh, a big batch of these golden trumpets into a tea and have you drink it, and they believed that would bust out the measles. Now, if you ever got the shingles, they would get the blood of a black chicken and put it all around where that big old scabby sore was, and the shingles would not spread past that ring of blood. So that's how they contained it. If you ever got a headache or um, a fever, they would make a tea from willow bark because you get aspirin from the willow tree. Now sometimes people got a bad case of the whooping cough and if it happened to a family member, some of the men would go out and they would shoot a bunch of these pileated or red-headed woodpeckers and they would take off all the feathers and throw away the bones and keep just the meat and they would put that woodpecker meat in a big pot like that with some water and make it into a nice stew. And you would have to have some of that woodpecker stew every day for five days. And that would cure your whooping cough. Now pioneers made their own soap and later on today I'll be doing a soap making demonstration here. So if you'd like to come back and see me make some homemade soap, I'll be here doing that. One o'clock, yes ma'am. Now, some of you have a map, and if you didn't get one, I have some extras you're welcome to look at. Would anybody like a map to look at? Okay, there's some pretty interesting place names in the Okie Finoki. Right, Matter right. of fact, there's, there's thousands of place names, but I marked a few of the most interesting on here in yellow. Starting up at the top of your map, that's the Cowhouse Island. This is Pioneer Island, which is man-made, but when you came onto the Vereen Bell Highway this morning, you entered the Cowhouse. That was the north side. This is the south side. The uh, Okefenokee Swamp Park is on the southern end of the cow house. And they called this the cow house because it was a really good place for these area pioneers to keep their cattle during the winter. Because with all the trees and vegetation, there was a lot for those cattle to eat. Whereas if they stayed out in the perimeter, a lot of that vegetation didn't have this covering and it would die off and the cows would get hungry. Now, at the end of the winter, when it was time for these cattle to go back to their uh, frontier homes, their pioneer homes, they would burn off an area and in just a few weeks, nice green vegetation would sprout up and those cows would smell it and that would draw them to leave the cowhouse island and go out to where this vegetation was and waiting for these cattle were the men of the families that had housed them here throughout the winter. And they had a big time watching these uh, cattle fight and you know, declare their territory for the female cows and uh, they would identify the cattle that they owned based on brands on the hip and marks that they would put on the ears and you would register your particular brand, your particular mark at the courthouse. And that was your proof that these were yours, okay? There are two Indian mounds on the cow house, that way, the part that we cannot access because it's federal, okay? 
it's all a part of the wildlife refuge and the federal government has a lot more authority in some areas than, than we do. We have to answer to them and to the state. All right, look into your map. Number two, the Bugaboo Island. If you'll go straight south, the Bugaboo Island, this island was named by Josiah Mazel in 1874 when a group of him and his buddies were there hunting overnight and one of the fellows was assigned to keep watch while the rest of them slept. Well, he was kind of off checking things out, making sure nothing came up and got to his sleeping friends. And while he was out, he heard this big booger, just a bellowing and a booing, and it scared him to pieces. He couldn't wait for daylight. And when his buddies woke up, he said, y'all would not believe what I heard last night. There was a booger and it was just a booing and a bellowing. Well, they had a big time with him on that. And this is where we get the name Bugaboo, okay? where the boogers were booing, where the boogers were scaring. All right, location three is the Chesser Island. And this was home mainly to the Chesser family from some say the 1850s, more likely it was the 1860s, until the 1970s. They were among the very last to sell their land to the federal government. Now they left long before they sold. They, set, they left by the 1950s because they couldn't uh, protect their livestock. When the federal government took this place over, you couldn't have firearms. So they couldn't kill the bears, they couldn't kill the panthers. And so a lot of the homesteaders just said, well, I can't stay here, I can't protect my stuff, and they left. Well, that was the Chesters, but they did finally sell their property about 1973. Look at number four. In the very southeastern corner of the swamp, this was a camp to deserter soldiers during the Civil War. However, it was also a camp for soldiers during the second Seminole War. Number five is Mitchell's Island, and it was named for the governor of the state of Georgia at one time, a Governor Mitchell, and there was also a surveyor uh, that was governor, that was, last name was Mitchell. All right, location number six is the Blackjack Island. Lots of big blackjack oaks there. Seven, Strange Island. Now I went to see why this was called Strange Island and there was not a reason okay. given at all. And I thought that was strange. But I asked one of my buddies if there was a reason for its name and he said, oh yeah. He said sometimes depending on the amount of rain that we've had, that affects the appearance of the island. Sometimes it looks like an island and sometimes it doesn't. So that makes it strange. All right, location number eight, Fiddler's Island. This used to be the home to a crazy man that played the fiddle. He lived there all by himself. Uh, location number nine, Honey Island, obviously was known for its fine quality and amount of honey. But unfortunately, when the Civil War deserters stayed here in the swamp in the 1860s, a lot of them cleared out that honey supply. Number 10, the pocket. This is a sandy ridge of land that extends toward the middle of the Okefenokee. You actually drive over the pocket as you get to the Stephen Foster State Park. And then you can get on a boat and access Billy's Island, which at one time was home to Seminoles but it was also a residence for as many as 600 people during the 1820s and 30s um, who were here employed by the Hebrew Cypress Company. And they had schools, churches, stores, movie theaters. Uh, you could just about get whatever you needed in the middle of the swamp on Billy's Island. And location number 12, Mixon's Hammock. This is a place where the Mixon family obviously had a homestead and I believe they had a mill where they uh, sawed timber. You could also uh, start turpentine steels near these regions. 
But Mixon's Hammock is noteworthy because back in the uh, 1770s, a Creek Indian named Hapoidal Tustanugi Fluco actually hid out on Mixon's Hammock to keep his family safe from the fighting between the British and the colonists. Now, after the war was over, he left because the bears and the panthers were too bad and he was having a hard time protecting his livestock and his family. Number 13, Minnie's Island, is named after a map maker, Minica, so Minnie's Island for short. And then 14 is the mysterious Floyd's Island. This is the island that William Bartram was told that daughters of the sun, beautiful Indian women lived, and that they had given food at one point to some fellow Creeks, but they told these soldiers, these uh, warriors, you cannot stay around here long because our husbands don't like outsiders. They're big, they're mean, and they don't want you here. So we're gonna feed you, we're gonna help you out, but you got to move along. Well, that story that William Bartram was told persisted over the years and many, many men have come into the swamp looking for this island of the beautiful women. And it is thought that it is Floyd's Island. It was named after General Charles Floyd by his men when he went to Floyd's Island looking for Billy Bowlegs in the 1830s. Do you have any questions or comments about information that's come up or maybe things that you're wondering about? I do. Okay. So why is it called a prairie around the island? What does that look like? Well, when we think of a prairie, we think of the Midwest, mm -hmm. a large expanse of land usually covered by grass. This is a large expanse of marshy water that may be covered also by grasses or by lily pads. Mm -hmm. And up under it, not very deep, maybe just a few inches, is usually some peat. And did that burn? In, in it can. Okay. Once you have drought to the point where your peat is exposed <coughs> and there's a lightning strike, it's flammable because of the methane that's put off by the decaying vegetation. Thank you, that confused me. <laughs> yeah, it, and some, uh, for example, a battery is another word that refers to the water in the swamp. You, you might find a battery in the prairie and a battery is just a big piece of peat that has detached, probably pushed up by the methane, and it's a dark area in the middle of a prairie. Now, they call it battery because it seemed to look like, to some people who had been in the Civil War, like a grouping of cannon, a battery of cannon. So there is that connection as well as far as the origin of the word battery. Now over time if these batteries become uh, stabilized enough, trees will actually sprout and grow. Okay, At that point they're called houses. They won't support people like you and me because it's too wet and too mushy, but they can support trees. And if you walk on these houses, those trees will actually shake because they are uh, on, on such trembling earth, if you will. Now, over time, a super house will become a bay. A bay is going to be more firm, more solid, and it's going to house a lot of trees. So, a bay is like a super house, but it's still not what we would think of as an island. Uh, their islands, a lot of them are referred to as hammocks because there is firm enough ground on which they can farm. And you'll also see pines, not just cypress, but you'll see pines, longleaf, slash pine. Uh, you'll also see cypress and you'll see um, various types of oaks. Okay, and it just makes a beautiful, beautiful uh, umbrella for people to live under and farm. 
So the hammocks are a lot more, hammocks are more like what we're on, okay, than anything else. Do you have any other questions or comments about swamp people? Well, we have some pretty interesting individuals. I think I'm out of time. Um, if you'd like to stay on, I'll go on, but you might want to go to the next demonstration. Uh, but Lydia Stone and Obadiah Barber are a lesson in and of themselves. Thank you. Oh, by the way, um, I made some soap for Valentine's Day. I'm going to be making more soap again in a couple of hours. But I made some especially for today. Olive oil and goat milk. These are $4. They're extremely heavy and good for the skin. These lighter ones here are $3. Olive oil and goat milk. And we've got them all bagged up real pretty for you. I've got two to a bag if you'd like to, and I got one to a bag. All of this down in here is olive oil and goat milk. These are olive oil and goat milk. Okay. Those are the ones y'all have. Thank you. And they smell.